Well, thanks to Matthew for reading Psalm 44. And uh, if you've been following us regularly on a Sunday morning, you know that we're going through this series on the Psalms. And uh, more recently, we've been looking at what might best be described as classic Psalms, Psalms which are particularly well known by people, Psalm 100, Psalm uh, 1, Psalm 23, and Psalm 121 last week. Well, now we're going to move to look at a whole series of different psalms which are known as laments. You might think of this musically as the blues. The blues music tradition is uh, a very powerful one. It speaks often of distress. It speaks often of need. By the way, if you can hear a bit of background noise, we're having a terrific downpour at the moment here. Uh, It should ease off in a few moments. But the blues speak of the darker side of life, our struggles, our loss, our fears, our anxieties. Um, I love the blues, they tell my story, David Coverdale once sang. And as we look at Psalm 44, we're going to be looking this morning at a real classic lament psalm. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some others as well. Now, if you were following this in a copy of the Bible, you might have noticed in your copy right at the beginning, before you get to verse 1, it's described as being a maskil. And you might say, what on earth is one of those? The truth is, we don't really know. We think it was a kind of musical term, a direction as to how this particular psalm should have been sung. And this, of course, is the reminder that psalms should be sung. And this is very interesting, isn't it, when we think of lament, because we often associate singing with praise. We think of singing with the positive things. We began our service this morning with a great hymn of praise, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. But this psalm was designed to be sung as well. And it's the reminder that the book of Psalms, as one theologian once put it, reflect the moods of the soul. And just as we are to sing about the good things and the praises of God, we are also now singing to acknowledge our struggles. Now, lament psalms make up about a third of the psalms. And you might be wondering right now, what is a lament psalm? I don't want to spend too long on this, but as we're going to be looking at a few of these over the next few weeks, I thought possibly a few moments addressing this question would be helpful for you. I know I found it helpful looking at it. The first thing we can say about lament psalms is that they are really helpful. And they're helpful in terms of our relationship with God when we find ourselves going through the real thick of it in life. The unpleasant experiences. You see, you know as well as I do that sometimes life can be extremely difficult and trying. The circumstances which we find ourselves in now because of COVID-19 are difficult and trying. And then there are other experiences which we all recognize will eventually come our way in life. Things like grief or fear or worry or anxiety. Life can throw these things at us and we can experience them. And maybe this morning you're going through the thick of some of this right now. Lament Psalms are helpful when we experience these things, but also they're helpful when we realize that we ourselves can be difficult and trying. When we sin, when we fail God, when we fail others, When our lives are touched with regret and shame, lament psalms can be extremely helpful. And then I suppose there are those experiences where sometimes our our knowledge, our, our real experience of God seems difficult and trying. Times when God seems to be far away, even absent. Times when we may feel we are indifferent to him or rather he's indifferent to us. And times when even we may doubt, lament psalms are really helpful in times like that. 
because they explore and express emotions and thoughts to do with these things. There's a lot about distress and regret and anxiety in these psalms, but the emphasis within them is always on being honest, sometimes brutally honest. And the crucial thing, it is always honesty before God. Now, why is this helpful? Well, you probably guessed already, this is really helpful because often life is just like this. And the fact that life is like this needs to be acknowledged by the Christian believer. Sadly, worship is sometimes seen by some Christians as really to be just a repeated expression of always positive experiences. We're always to be happy, always to be joyful, always to be encouraged. The tone is always to be upbeat. It's interesting that there are very few, it seems to me, contemporary hymns and songs being written today about the disappointments in life. Most are written in praise. Now, there is a sense where the majority should be, but the absence of contemporary writing in the areas that Psalm 44 and the other lament psalms engage with is perhaps significant. And there are, of course, problems if our view of the Christian life is like this, that it's always to be upbeat, always positive, always great. And the biggest problem is it just frankly lacks reality. It becomes an escape from suffering and pain and distraction from the ordinary and the mundane by rather sticking our head in the sand and pretending that these other things don't happen. Should Christian experience and worship be like that? Similarly, it creates alienation because people who find themselves in an environment where they've been told all the time that as a Christian you're to be joyful and praising God and, and, and full of blessing and wonders and that that's how it is. What happens when your life hits difficulties? Worst of all, it presents a false view of God. It prevents, presents to us the idea that he can only relate to us in the good times. Again, this is why lament psalms are really helpful. They show us God present in our distress. And this is so helpful. It's interesting, the first church that I was in, there was a, a man in the church who was quite influential and he used to tell me very openly, it was in Yorkshire, so it was pretty straight what they used to say to you, that um, he didn't care for those Welsh hymns, as he called them, uh, in the minor key. They're very depressing, he said. Want to get away from that when you come to church? He preferred hymns, which I always thought were a bit more the sort of English public school tunes. And uh, that, that was his argument. Didn't want that mournful stuff. No, you come to church, to, uh, at least you come to worship, to get away from that. The problem was, I knew that he was going through some real big difficulties in work, in his marriage, and in his family. You see, worship is not to be a distraction. Worship is not simply a way to feel good. Worship is about honest engagement with God. And in the whole sphere of human experience, there are times when being honest in our worship means bringing our distresses to God. The theologian philosopher Nicholas Wultersdorf tragically lost his son Eric at the age of 25 in a climbing accident in Austria. He wrote a profound little book simply called Lament for a Son. It is a remarkable book on grief and he wrote it as a way of grieving. And in that book he writes about the context of Christian worship asking a question. Are there songs for singing when the light has gone dim? How do we worship when the lights go out and the darkness descends and our fears press in on us and our discouragements seem large 
and our regret and our shame presses us down. Now, lament psalms are massively helpful here and hugely neglected in the church today. Although at the same time, I have to say, in things I've been reading, particularly during COVID, written by Christians, they've talked about, oh, the importance of lamenting. We need to lament. But in doing so, they seem to forget that when you look carefully at the lament psalms, we've been presented with a particular way to lament. In other words, we shouldn't say to one another, we're Christians, we're going through a hard time, just let it all out, just say as it really is. In some ways that can be helpful, it can be very cathartic, can't it? The Lament Psalms don't actually do that. Instead they invite us to complain, but complain in the presence of God. If you like, Lament Psalms are complaining prayer. Or even, we could say this morning, complaining worship. But at the same time, lament psalms are about complaining faith. Hard emotions being expressed in the presence of God with the hope of deliverance that ultimately anticipates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what lament psalms are. Let me say that again. It's important, isn't it? Lament psalms are hard emotions openly expressed in the context of trusting God for the hope of deliverance that is ultimately anticipating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this, friends, brings meaning to our struggles and to our suffering. Comfort in lament. And lament psalms even invite us to see evil experiences as ultimately a blessing from God. Well, that's a bit of an introduction to lament psalms. And uh, let's look now at Psalm 44. The first point we have here is that this psalm begins in the first eight verses by speaking of our glorious past. Verse 1, we have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what you did in their days, in days long ago. Now, it's always easy to look at the past as being much, more, much better than the present. To speak of the good old days, when, you know, everything was better. Stuff was cheaper in the shops. The sun shone for longer. You always had snow in the winter at the right time. Life seemed much simpler and clearer. And it does seem to me that the older you get, the brighter the good old days appear. Now in Wales, I think often in terms of the church, we have got stuck reflecting on the good old days. You see, it's easy sometimes to hide in the memories of the past or talk about the past and reflection on the past. It's easy to hide ourselves away in there and neglect the challenges which are actually in front of us. Now here the memory of God's work in Israel in the past in this psalm is presented to us as being both wonderful and troubling. Wonderful, why? Well, verses 1 to 3 are filled with memories of our father's days. So in verse 2, we are shown that uh, in the past, God gave to his people Israel the land of Canaan, the land of the promise. What a, what a wonderful time that was. And then there are memories in verses 4 to 8, which begin to come to mind, which aren't so much in the good old days. They're more in the recent history as the psalmist remembers the pleasant memories in his own lifetime though through you we push back our enemies through your name we trample our foes now in all of these memories to do with the good old days and even recent history God's work is acknowledged these memories are good because God worked so we read in verse 3 
It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you love them. How was it that we can look back on the past, the psalmist is saying, and say we've had some great days? And the answer is, they were great because God was with us, working for us. Verse 7, you gave us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. So, memories of the good old days can be wonderful, but they also can be troubling. Why? Well, the problem is, when you compare, as the psalmist is doing here, what is going on right now with the good old days, you begin to realize just how bad the present is. And as the psalmist writes here, he writes in such a way that he, he seems to suggest that the God who is so powerfully at work in Israel in the past is now missing in the present. And worse than this, it seems God has now turned against Israel. Which brings us to our second main point here this morning, the disastrous present which is verse 9 to verse 22. And it's in this section that the tone changes dramatically, and this is where the lament really begins. Verse 9 and 10. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy, and our adversaries have plundered us. goes on to speak about being devoured like sheep and scattered presumably like sheep as well, in verse 11. In verse 12, being sold for a pittance, regarded by God as being worthless. He speaks about them now being a reproach and a byword amongst the nations, and to be pitied, disgrace and shame are with them all day, and their enemies mock them and plot revenge. Well, just as it was in looking at the good old days and acknowledging this was all done by God's hand, the disastrous present, the psalmist tells us, is also the result of God's hand as well. Verse 1, and verse 10, and verses 13 and 14 speak about how God, you made us, you, but at the same time, you gave us up. You see, the terrible things that are happening to them have been in retreat and devoured and scattered and plundered and sold. These terrible things now are coming to them from God's hand. So just as God had blessed them in the past, it seems now God is judging them in the present. And you know, just when you think things can't get worse, they do. Verses 17 and 19, to 17 to 19. All this happened to us, though we had not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path, but you crushed us. This is the heart of the lament. And it is deeply confusing. And it is a major theme in lament psalms. Everything that comes our way is from God. There are many things that we cannot understand. And as the psalmist writes here, he is bringing this complaint. We are still faithful to you. We have not strayed from your path, but you have crushed us. I think this goes absolutely to the heart of many life experiences. Sudden disaster descending on a faithful Christian. Sudden difficulty perhaps coming your way. You see, as human beings, we seem to make a connection that somehow bad things should be happening to bad people and good things to good people. There's a very uh, popular book, it was written not that long ago, it's simply called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. It's written by a Jewish rabbi, Harold Kushner, whose three-year-old son was diagnosed with a degenerative disease. And the, the, the argument of that book 
which has proved extremely popular, is that, well, actually God doesn't send us bad things, but instead he's with us in the bad things, doing his best to help us. And in fact, I have to say to you this morning that it's not just rabbis who might think that. There are some Christian leaders who will tell you that. That somehow God is unable to stop the bad things in life. But the big thing about God, they say, is he, he's with us, suffering with us. Now, I want to say this is a very understandable view of life. But the problem with it is it serves up a God who is not really in control. Indeed, the God it presents is as much a victim of evil and suffering as we are. He is not greater than evil. He is not all-powerful. Instead, he is all-comforting. Now, this psalm takes us to a very hard truth. And the hard truth is this, that actually the God of the Bible is entirely different to all that I've just described there from people who think this way. As mysterious as it is, it tells us again and again that God is in control of everything, including suffering. Whether that suffering is deserved or undeserved suffering. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like the sound of this. I really don't. But the truth is, we must be honest to what the Word of God says. And we must recognize what it has to say about God's all-powerful nature and the reality of suffering in our lives. But, and this is a very, very big but, this is not all that the Bible says has to say. Which brings us to our third point in this psalm. O oh Lord, why? Verse 23 to verse 26. You see, here's the challenge. How do you worship in times when suffering comes and it seems as if no one has really done anything wrong? How do you pray when disaster comes suddenly to the faithful? Now, I want you to notice that the response in this psalm is that at times like this, and they will come your way, you are not to start blaming yourself, which is what we tend to do as people. It's what Job's friends did when his life was suddenly plunged into the darkest of chaos and suffering. They sit around him, they're quiet for seven days. It was about the best thing they did. Because when they start to open their mouths, they start to say things to him like, well, Job, tell us what you've done. You must have done something really bad, hidden and secret, that God is afflicting your life in this way. And we think like that. When disaster comes, we, often the default setting amongst many Christians is to say, well, well, clearly God is punishing me because of who I am or what I've done. And it's not really hard, is it, in the life of a Christian to look at things that you have done or not done which are sinful and wrong and say, aha, it must be because of that God is now punishing me. The argument is that, that bad things and suffering are coming my way simply because I must have sinned. I want to say this is far, far too simplistic. This line of thought is not borne out in this psalm. And in fact, if you pursue that line of thought, it will only add to your pain and suffering, often unnecessarily. It's interesting, I mentioned about in Wales, we often look too much at the past and we're often locked in the past rather than dealing with the really challenging stuff right in front of us. But there's been a tendency in Wales amongst Christians to blame our spiritual decline in the present simply on ourselves. We have sinned. Or maybe to look at a particular sin amongst Christians or a particular sin in society. This must be the reason. As if it's the only explanation. Now it may be the explanation. 
But I want to say to you this morning, it's not the only explanation. This psalm tells us how to pray. When disaster comes upon us, for no apparent reason, instead of blaming yourself, it invites us to pray, Lord, wake up and help us. That's the invitation of Psalm 44, verse 23. Awake, Lord. Why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? How should we pray when disaster falls upon us? And we see no meaning or sense in it. We're to call out to God. Lord, wake up. Be present. Lord, help us. It's the simplest of prayers. And it recognizes that not only the Lord can help, but that he may help. And here in Psalm 44, we are being told to pray this prayer. But you may find yourself thinking, but, but what if God won't help? Or what if getting help from God is just a bit of a lottery? Which brings us to a great and wonderful hope that turns the black sky to brilliant light. And it's where this psalm ends. Verse 26. Well, let me take 25 as well. We are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Redeem us because of your unfailing love. The hope in this psalm is that the God who we appeal to in times of mysterious suffering and distress is the same one who will never fail to love us. The theme of God's unfailing love is glorious. It is pointing us to the reality that the love of God is always present in the teeth of the fiercest storm. The love of God towards a Christian is the one great certainty in the Christian's life, irrespective of what's happening. The love of God is not a lottery, but it is a promise and a possession. Now this theme of God's unfailing love is picked up by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8, which was the psalm we began this service with. Sorry, the passage we began this service with. And interestingly in there, he quotes Psalm 44. And you might have noticed it when Matthew was reading it to us. He quotes verse 22. For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. That's what Psalm 44 44 says in verse 22 it's an expression of real despair Lord the whole situation is hopeless even though we are faithful for your sake we face death all day long now Paul employs this in Romans chapter 8 as he speaks about the love of God let me read that passage from Romans 8 to you again verse 35 to 39 who shall separate us from the love of Christ then he goes through a list. Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. And it's at this point he quotes Psalm 44. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. There's the challenge. Can something separate us from the love of God? After all. We face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. There's the challenge. There's the question. Can anything separate us from the love of God? To which he answers emphatically, no. No. In all these things, in our sufferings, in our times in life when we are being overwhelmed, 
in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then Paul adds, I'm convinced. He's building off a lifetime of experience of difficulty and persecution. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels, demons, the present, the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. You name it, says Paul. Whatever you can think of, your nightmare scenario, your deepest fear, your greatest anxiety, name it. Says Paul, I am convinced that none of these things, including your own particular fears, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this is what Psalm 44 is pointing us forwards to. The love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, redeem us because of your unfailing love. Where do we see the unfailing love of God most clearly? It's in Jesus. For God so loved the world, so loved, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. Nicholas Wultersdorf, in that remarkable book about the death of his son, Lament for a Son, says right at the beginning, every lament is a love song. And so I encourage you today in your sorrows, in your distress, and in your needs to bring those distresses to God in words that have meaning for you. Be free in the presence of God as you bring your lament to Him. Do not hold back with words but be yourself in the presence of God in prayer and bring your complaint to him express your distress and your anxiety and bring the conclusion of it all to this wonderful comforting mysterious focus Nothing, though, can separate me from your unfailing love in Jesus Christ. This love can be known. And as I close here this morning, maybe you say, well, I, I'm not a Christian. My life's just a mess. I don't know where to turn. It really is getting to the point where it's seeming too much for me. I want you to realize this morning, I'm not saying to you, become a Christian and all your troubles will go away. Psalm 44 shows that that is not the case. But I do want to say to you this morning, there is a love to be known that is an unfailing love. As one hymn writer once put it, the love that reaches deeper than the depths of self-despair. And where is that love found? In Jesus Christ. Uniquely, exclusively, unashamedly exclusively, it's found in Jesus Christ. Who with the love of the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And the love of Christ is most clearly seen as he goes to the cross and dies for our sins and pays the penalty we have run up with God he writes it off forever and then he rises from the dead 
to offer sufferers like you and me eternal hope, eternal life, and unfailing love. Yes, your problems won't go away. If you become a Christian, you'll wake up tomorrow, you still will have not enough money in your bank account, you'll still have maybe those health issues and worries, but you will have the knowledge that you are loved eternally and in an unfailing way. If today you would put your faith in Jesus Christ, say to him, with all the distress in my life, I cannot face life on my own. I need you. Oh, I need you. Come to me. Cleanse me of my sins. Take my shame away and make me new.